The school secretary called me in my classroom on the third day of school to say that one of my senior girls, Chloe, whom I had not yet met, was hiding out in her office. Chloe had been trying to come to my English class, which met first period, but the first two days of school, she had only made it to the hallway outside of my room before she panicked and turned around. Chloe was too anxious to walk into my room, which was a large class of seniors. I walked up to the office to introduce myself to her and walked her down to my classroom. On the way, I promised her that we would make a plan to make this class work for her. I told her that I had anxiety too and that one of the things that helped me was always sitting near an exit. So I offered her a seat right next to the door and reminded her to breathe. I asked her to try to stay for class, but that if at any time she needed to get up and walk out, she could do so without asking me. She settled in. I never called on her or did anything to draw attention to her that day. Chloe stayed for class and came back the next day. As the weeks went on, her body language became more relaxed. As I always do, I found opportunities in my class to do mental health check-ins and to use the books that we read to talk about mental health. By the end of the quarter, she blended in with the rest of the class, worked in small groups, shared herself with me through her writing, and even spoke in class discussions. She got help with anxiety from a counselor, thrived in my class, and graduated that June. This story about Chloe is a total manifestation of the line, be the person you needed when you were young. If I had had a teacher who normalized anxiety for me when I was a kid, I could have avoided so much suffering. Social and emotional learning, or SEL, is an incredibly important part of the work we all do as teachers. Whether we call it SEL or not, whether we call it teaching the whole child or not, Good teachers embed social and emotional work into all that we do, and this is good. We need to be paying attention to our kids' feelings, otherwise we can't meet our academic goals or even get them into the classroom door. SEL was formalized in the 90s and is now commonly incorporated into all schools, K through 12. In 2021, the Collaboration for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, or CASEL, was added to the main learning results, and it includes five areas that schools are asked to address with students. Self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. These are called the CASEL Five. SEL was designed to be proactive and preventative. We take care of our kids' social and emotional needs to prevent mental illness and to help them be healthy humans, to succeed in school and in life. Humor me here as an English teacher, let me use a good metaphor. SEL is proactive in the way that forest fire prevention tends to the forest to keep them from catching a blaze. But anyone in the classroom knows, our kids' mental health is really suffering now more than ever. There are flames everywhere. We also need to keep, teach kids what to do once they are on fire. No one from Castle called me to ask me my opinion when this five-part framework was created, but if they had, I would have implored them to add a sixth area of focus, and that is direct discussion of mental health. Aside from teaching kids to manage emotions, we need to normalize the fact that emotions sometimes feel out of our control, and that is also okay, and there are steps we can take to get better. Adolescents today are experiencing mental health mental illness at higher rates than they ever have, 40% more than 10 years ago. And most mental disorders show up around age 13. Only one in five students gets the treatment that they need. A significant barrier to students seeking help is a lack of comfort in talking about mental health. Stigma around mental health requires our urgent attention because it is not simply a social phenomenon. It's an actual determinant of mental care outcomes. If we as teachers can normalize talking about mental health, students will seek help sooner. Simply decreasing stigma around mental health will make our kids better. We don't have enough counselors or social workers in our schools to sufficiently address the needs of all of our students, but teachers can do their part. English teachers have an incredible opportunity to authentically embed discussions of mental health into our work. We can use reflective writing prompts to do mental health check-ins. We can make it normal to talk about mental health struggles and coping strategies. 
We can read books where a character is depressed or anxious and not be afraid to talk about it. Last March, I presented at the Maine Council for Teachers of English Conference, and I asked a room full of English teachers, what books do you already teach where it would make sense to talk about mental health? We filled together four pieces of chart paper with book titles, to name a few. We can use Catcher in the Rye, Macbeth, and Into the Wild to talk about depression. We can use Lord of the Flies and Frankenstein and Turtles All the Way Down to talk about anxiety. Dear Martin, The Things They Carried, and Born a Crime to talk about PTSD. I'm not talking about artificially inserting mental health into our classrooms. I'm saying, just don't ignore it. I'm suggesting we continue to teach novels and short stories and vocabulary and grammar and poetry and annotation and research, and that when the context and the timing is right, to teach mental health too. Teachers of any subject can validate kids' feelings, offer support, and create a classroom environment where kids feel safe. <clears throat> Teachers of any subject can use what one researcher refers to as the skillful self-disclosure, where a teacher shares at appropriate times their own experiences or strategies with mental health. When I started sharing about my anxiety with my students, it became my superpower. If my students see me as capable and strong when they know I'm sometimes anxious and yet I still show up every day, it takes the shame and power away from their own struggles. It gives them hope and permission to ask for help. Teaching about feelings and mental health should not be happening in separate pull-out programs or in special assemblies. Teenagers especially find this artificial. Tell your high schoolers that you're going to do SEL and their eyes will collectively roll. <laughs> Integrate these lessons authentically into what you are doing in class and they eat it up. Teenagers love to share their feelings and opinions. One of my favorite ways to describe the adolescent brain that I came across in my reading is tumultuous but malleable. That means that at this tender and vulnerable stage, teenage brains can be shaped. Teachers can help them become more empathetic of others' experiences, and most importantly, we can help them be empathetic of themselves. When I met Chloe at the beginning of that school year, she did not need forest fire prevention strategies. She needed help putting her fire out. She needed an environment where even though she was feeling distress, she felt safe and seen. And she needed to be reminded that after the fires go out, new growth occurs and healthy forests return. I have taught 100 Chloe's over the years. If you're in a classroom, help kids by normalizing mental health discussions. And if you're a supporter of education, help people in the community understand that SEL and talking about mental health does not need to be something radical, political, or separate from what good teachers already do. It's simply the way we meet our kids at the door. As teachers, we have enormous power to help and all the tools we need within us. Thank you.